Hey everybody, uh, welcome. This is our second day of Another World is Possible, an impact-driven multimedia festival uh, hosted by us here at Eaton Workshop. Uh, my name is Sebi. I'm the uh, uh, Global Director of Impact and I'm based here in Washington, DC. And I'm joined by a very old friend um, of mine, John Steinbach, who um, he, has, he wears many hats in the activist community here in the DC area. But today he's wearing his hat as a, an organizer for the uh, Hiroshima Nagasaki Peace Committee, um, talking about his work with uh, Michiko Kodama, a survivor of the Hiroshima atomic bomb when she was seven years old. She came and uh, visited the DC area on a speaking tour um, to talk about nuclear disarmament, uh, nuclear weapons and the movement for peace. Um, her message was really powerful and inspired us to make a short film about her visit to the DC area. And along the way, uh, John Steinbeck and uh, a few other of his comrades of the Hiroshima Nagasaki Peace Committee uh, really helped us facilitate both the creation of the documentary film, which we screened earlier, um, as well as the in-person event that we were able to host at Eaton DC. Um, which brought together uh, a lot of people in the DC, uh, in, the, in the peace movement in Washington, DC. And um, an enduring legacy of uh, uh, Michiko Kodama's visit to um, Washington, DC was uh, a thousand paper cranes folded by survivors of the Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombings that now lives as permanent exhibition um, uh, in the hallway behind our radical library. Um, there's a plaque there um, talking about the symbolism of a thousand paper cranes, and we'll talk about that soon. Um, but the uh, the the exhibit is special because it's interactive. Um, at, guests at Eaton DC are welcome to take a paper crane with them, uh, which which is a symbol of peace. Before we get into this panel, and um, I allow John to more um, thoroughly introduce himself, I'm going to play a um, a short message that uh, Michiko Kodama sent us um, two years later from her, or I guess a year later from her visit um, with, an up, with uh, some reflections on her visit to DC and an update on her work today. So I'm gonna play this short two minute message. Um, it's recorded in Japanese, um, which is her, her language, but I'm going to be reading a translation of it. So I'll be sort of interpreting in real time as the video plays. And you'll have to forgive me if the uh, if the uh, timing isn't perfect. I'm, I'm not interpreting. I don't speak Japanese, unfortunately, but I will be reading a translation of this message. So uh, without further ado, I will uh, pull up that video from Ichiko Kodama so we can open. last year. He welcomed me with warm hospitality and it was especially encouraging to be able to participate in your wonderful activities by giving my testimony. I learned a great deal. Thank you very much. The Hiroshima and Nagasaki Days events in DC were memorials like none I had experienced before. I will never forget the deeply emotional experiences I had there. When I heard the song, Never Forgive the Atomic Bomb, sung in the vigil before the White House on Nagasaki Day, I was surprised and brought to the verge of tears by an enormous feeling of sincerest gratitude. While I stayed in DC, I was able to meet many people, such as those from the church on the first day of my visit and the other church on the Hiroshima day. Even when I was late to join the meeting where people were waiting for me in the rain, everyone listened to my testimony in earnest and asked me many questions. I was able to meet many people doing grassroots peace activism in the country that dropped the atomic bombs. Hibakusha, survivors of the bombings, have called on everyone to condemn the inhumanity of nuclear weapons. I now believe that these steady efforts are what have helped bring the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons into effect. Hibakusha are aging, but we will continue to walk the path towards our goal. 
We are now working on securing a ratification for the treaty by the Japanese government as soon as possible, since we are the only nation that has experienced atomic bombings in wartime. I'm looking forward to seeing you all again when the COVID-19 crisis is over. Let's keep working for a world without nuclear weapons. By Michiko Kodama, Hiroshima Hibakusha. So, um, so that's her message. Um, and now I'm going to give the floor to John Steinbach of the Hiroshima Nagasaki Peace Committee. So, Sebi, uh, you're, you're right. We are very old friends. I, I remember when you were probably four or five years old and you would help to hold the blanket for a blanket dance so that we could collect money to to do the activities for Piscataway Indian Nation. So, uh, but 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 you and I now you're an adult and uh, and we continue to work together. Uh, so it's a, a pleasure to be here. Um, I just want everyone to know that uh, our committee has been working since 1983. We hosted our first delegation of A-bomb survivors. Uh, we were actually told. Uh, when they were on their way on the airplane that they were coming. So we went to the Methodist building to Women's Strike for Peace, and we organized a welcoming, and nobody came. And I remember that Edith Villastrigo and Louise Franklin Ramirez, my wife, uh, went to every single office in the Methodist building and shamed them into coming down and welcoming the Ibakasha. So that was the beginning and we've been doing it pretty much every year ever since. So uh, the survivors almost from the beginning, from 1946, have been organizing around the anniversary of the atomic bombing. And they believe that it is their witness because they are the only people who have actually experienced the bomb. They believe that by keeping alive the memory of what happened to them in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, that they are helping to keep the world alive. And their greatest fear is when they're gone and there's no one there to warn the world about the horrors of nuclear weapons, that nuclear weapons will be used again. And that if nuclear weapons are ever used again, it will not be possible to contain them and it will mean the end of the world. And so today, uh, Mishukadama is, well, I think she's 82 now, and uh, she's still in very good shape, but most of the Bakasha are quite elderly. The ones that can come generally were uh, infants or small children. They don't have real clear memories. Uh, and uh, so, and, and yet they continue to come, they continue to expend their energy to warn us about the horrors of nuclear weapons. So that's why we do what we can do to enable them, to welcome them and take care of their needs while they're here. And I wanna thank the Eaton Hotel for the wonderful hospitality that you showed Ms. Kadama. Thank you. Um, yeah, it's a super important message. And for me, you know, we talk about a lot of different intersecting issues and causes that we're working on right now. I mean, for me, my background being in the indigenous movement, but, um, you know, being very closely uh, related uh, and in relation to the immigration movement, which you, John, also are extremely involved down there in Prince William County. Um, the issue of the movement for Black Lives is, is very dear to my heart. Um, you know, we have all these different issues um, and uh, they intersect in, a, in, in, very, in, in very critical ways. And I think um, when we talk about the peace movement and nuclear disarmament, um, it's, it's, it's almost so vast, it's so huge, um, the, the enormity of the atomic bomb. I think it's hard for people to get their head around it because for a lot of people, they don't interact with the atomic bomb every day. They, they interact with racism every day. They interact with immigration every day. Native people interact with land struggles and other issues like that every day. But um, the atomic bomb is just this big shadow over the whole globe. Um, and so um, I, I wanted to ask you, John, as, as an organizer, how do you get people to relate to that? Like, how do you get people to connect with this issue that is so big and it's so existential? Because it's like, if a, if a bomb is ever dropped again, 
we won't really have time to argue about it because the world will, will end, you know? So how do you organize around this? Well, well, we, we approach people where they are. So you raised the issue of the indigenous movement. So then I would respond, well, from the very beginning, it is the indigenous peoples of the world that have been the primary victims. We work with radiation survivors all over the world. So for example, the uranium that was used to destroy Hiroshima was mined by the Congo uranium miners. Then the they bombs that were tested in the Pacific, that uranium was mined by the Navajo, the Diné, Navajo uranium miners. And, and most of them died horrible, horrible deaths because they were knowingly sent down into tunnels to dig out the uranium and to breathe in the radiation from the from the, the the uranium, the radon, and the other radioactive materials, they died horrible deaths. Virtually all of them. Very few Navajo, traditional Navajo, smoke, and yet lung cancer was epidemic. So that's another connection. Another connection would be the Nevada test site, where over a hundred atmospheric tests were exploded. Is Western Shoshone Treaty land, the Treaty of Rudy, Ruby Valley. That land was confiscated by the US government without comp comp compensation and used to test the nuclear weapons. You can go to Algeria where the French and Israeli tests were carried out and those were indigenous African peoples. In Tahiti, it was Mururoa and it was the people of, of, of Tahiti. Uh, the Marshall Islanders were killed. Uh, the Kazakhs were indigenous people. So all over the world, the primary victims were indigenous people. So there's the connection there. Uh, if we're talking about climate change, that's the other existential threat to humanity. We have two of them. One is nuclear war, which would quickly destroy all life on earth and uh, climate change, which is slowly destroying all life on earth. And as climate change, progressive, and as we see more and more instability, resource depletion, we're going to see more and more regional wars. Uh, Michael Clare, Professor Michael Clare has written three or four books about this. Every time you have a regional war, you are lowering the threshold to nuclear war and the possibility that the United States, Russia, China, or, or in the Middle East, Israel, or in Southwest Asia, Pakistan and India are going to use nuclear weapons. And then the Ibaka shall warn us, if that happens, they cannot be controlled and that's the end of the world. So the connections are, are there. If we're talking about militarism, we're talking about patriarchy. We're talking about feminism. So to, and we're, when we're talking about poverty and healthcare and so on, we're talking about guns and butter. Where currently the United States government is spending a trillion and a half dollars to totally rebuild the nuclear weapons bomb complex for another 60 to 70 years. So when you are on your deathbed, Sebi, they're planning to still have nuclear weapons. So these are the connections that we have to make, and we need to educate, you know, the public public that nuclear weapons are a real threat to all of us and the issue of nuclear weapons is connected to every other struggle. That, and that's so important I think to, to address those intersections because so much so 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 often we get caught up in, in, in whatever the news cycle is whatever the cause of the day um, and um, yeah it's so important to talk about how these things intersect and I wanted to um, I wanted to ask you because you touched on this a little bit um, we have the testimony of the Hibaksha, which is which is so critical um, because of the gravity that it holds. Um, but something I found compelling uh, when uh, Michiko Kodama visited us in, D in DC was the presence of one of the downwinders, um, someone who had grown up or been exposed to nuclear testing um, in the 1950s, I believe. Um, so I was wondering if you could speak a little bit to the experience of the downwinders, um, the people who are also part of this, you know, massive collateral
damage of nuclear weapons. You know, you're, you're talking about Dennis Nelson, Dr. De Dennis Nelson. He's a retired research scientist at NIH, and he grew up in the 50s and 60s, early 60s in St. George, Utah, and they used to go out and watch the explosion, and then the ash would come in and it would cover everything, and they were never warned that it was dangerous, and uh, of course they were Mormons. They were amongst the most patriotic of all Americans. They, of course, they didn't smoke or drink. And it was his aunt who was one of the early leaders of the Don Winder movement. And she went out and started documenting her family and her neighbors and how this person over here had this cancer and this person over here had this cancer. And so she slowly educated the people in St. George about what had been done, that they were literally treated as guinea pigs. So, so when they would explode a bomb, they would wait until the wind was blowing away from Los Angeles and away from Las Vegas and away from Salt Lake City. That left one place, and that was St. George, Utah, and Cedar City, also Utah. And so that, those were the two major towns that were over and over and over again repeatedly uh, exposed to nuclear fallout. And the, the thing about Dennis's testimony, and I know, I know you heard this, is how similar in many ways his testimony was to her testimony. She talked about her family and the history of cancers and radiation sickness. And Dennis talked about the same thing. His sister died when she was 40 and his mother died when she was in her 40s and his many operations that he's had. So uh, the Hibakusha actually have a saying, and that is that we are all Hibakusha. So, and it's not just the downwinders. It's not just the Navajo uranium miners. It's not just the atomic veterans. It's literally every single one of us on the planet has molecules of radioactive material in incorporated into our bodies that were initiated in the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki because you know that explosion was an, in both cases was an air explosion and it went you know 30 40,000 feet into the lower stratosphere and it was carried all over the world so nuclear testing nuclear fallout fallout from nuclear power you know has affected all of us so um, again the connection is very easy to make you just have to use your imagination and make it. And another question I had was, you know, when during the trip to DC and in general, whenever I've I've intersected with the anti-nuclear movement, that global peace movement, um, something I've noticed from, you know, Michiko Kodama, who, you know, the Ibakusha, who are are elderly, they're in their 80s um, and up now. Um, a lot of the folks in the peace movement, anti-war movement, you know, are, are getting older. And, um, you know, what is the future of the anti-nuclear movement? Because um, how, how do we engage um, a, new, a new audience, a new demographic with this movement? Because you, your generation and, and, and your, your, your generation of community organizers, you've been the torchbearer um, but you but you were the torchbearer, but you're bridging a previous generation even. I mean, you're you're bridging a generation of of survivors, you know, of the Hibakusha, the first generation of Hibakusha. And you're bridging that generation over through the 20th century into the 21st. And who do you see, who do you see uh, as the torchbearers now? Um, how's well, what's the of that movement? Well, I mean, it was the A-bomb survivors that really started the anti-nuclear movement. And then it was picked up on people like Bertram Russell, Norman Cousins here in the United States, uh, the campaign for nuclear disarmament in Britain. Uh, and then uh, the Vietnam War came. A lot of the anti-nuclear uh, activists opposed the war. Uh, those who understood the connections always made the connection between the Viet war in Vietnam, the, the, the American war, as they called it, and nuclear weapons. And then uh, it became those of my generation, we, most of us started actually opposing nuclear power. And then we were quickly educated that nuclear, you can't separate nuclear power technology and nuclear bomb technology, because 
the technologies on the in the on on the front end, in the back end, it's the same thing. And and every we used to say every reactor is a potential bomb factory. They all produce plutonium. Plutonium is a fissile material. That was what was used in the Nagasaki bomb. So we came out of that, and then Ronald Reagan and the freeze movement and people really got involved, a million people in uh, Central Park. I was there. Uh, and then uh, the targeting changed a little bit. And I remember when Bill Clinton around 1995 or 96, he went on TV and said, uh, the children of the United States no longer have to have nuclear nightmares. The nuclear threat is over. And that was a signal to the nation that we don't have to worry about nuclear weapons. And so it is, uh, it is a challenge. And we have another existential threat, which is climate change, which is slower, but also absolutely certain. So we have both of these existential threats. Both of these threats are connected. They, they feed on each other. And uh, so it is a challenge and young people, I don't want, want to stereotype, but generally speaking, many young people see climate change as either the main threat or in some cases, virtually the only threat. And uh, so it's, it's partly a question of education. Uh, and, 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 and I think that it, it bringing the, the A-bomb survivors here and to keep bringing the issue up and over and over and over again each time for a different audience is the key to, to making certain that the nuclear disarmament doesn't die. And, and in fact, yeah. we, the, the movement has just achieved a pretty substantial goal on January 22nd, the prohibition yeah on nuclear weapons is going into effect. So technically, nuclear weapons are going to be illegal internationally. Although of course, none of the nuclear nations have signed on. So right. it's, not going, it's not going to re refer to them, but it's still an important symbolic victory. And also I think an important and useful tool for nuclear, for campaigners for nuclear disarmament to use and hold it up and say, you know, finally, the people of the world understand that, you know, the absurdity that we've banned nuclear new mines and we banned chemical and biological weapons, and yet nuclear weapons are totally legal. But now, right. on January 22nd, right. at least technically, yes. they'll be illegal. But yeah, you know, and that's a, that's a huge victory. Like you said, it's a policy victory. It's a, it's a symbolic victory. And it's a moral victory for the world to, to rise up and repudiate that. And, um, you know, uh, I, I really, I, I really have learned a lot from talking this through with you and also, you know, having that visceral feeling of meeting Mitch Kokodam and hearing her testimony in person. You're right. There's nothing like that. And as we focus so hard, my, our generation focuses so intensely on climate change because to us, it's the existential threat. You know, it, it's really important to keep the nuclear conversation at the forefront because I think some people are proposing nuclear power as, as a solution. So the, the more scared we get, of climate change, the more we want to run to nuclear power. And by bringing forth this testimony and bringing forth these movements and this narrative, um, I think it really interrupts that and makes us think more deeply about um, energy consumption and capitalism. So I, I think it's like as relevant as ever. And um, and I really appreciate your help in, get, in uh, um, pulling this film together, um, exposing me and a lot of other people to the anti-nuclear movement in a more intimate way. Um, for people to get involved, um, you know, they can check out the Hiroshima Nagasaki Peace Committee of the National Capital Region, um, as well as uh, peaceaction.org was where you had us um, direct folks to, um, to get involved and keep an eye out on, the, uh, on this movement. Let, let, let me give our URL. It's okay. Hirosh Hiroshima peacecommittee.net and we have a lot of good information including a number of videos of teachings we've done in the last couple years so if people want to become more educated uh, go there and you can communicate with us through the website thanks so much john we're going to wrap for now but thanks thank for uh, for your time thanks ebby